Every, every day, he calls me to be his disciple. He has called me to follow him. A disciplined follower of Jesus Christ. To live by his word. To live out his word. To be so grounded in his word that I am not shaken when troubles arrive or challenges come. I am instructed to pass on his word to the next generation, to those yet need to hear. He challenges me to pray continuously without ceasing to develop an intimate relationship with Him. One that is marked by continual prayer. I must be generous with all that I have. And in everything I do. Understanding this life is not about me, but about Him. So many yet need to know His love, His power, His forgiveness, His saving grace. I must be about sharing life and sharing faith at every given opportunity. I must seek to not only be a disciple, but to make disciples in the power of the Holy Spirit. To live a life of faith, unwavering faith, every, every day, in every way. Amen. How many are glad to be disciples of Jesus today? Amen. Praise God. Prayerfully, everybody was able to receive a booklet. These are again are available in the foyer. We want to make sure that everyone has one of these uh, for our study this morning. Today we are going to be looking at session number three. But before we get there, we want to remind everybody of the steps that we have been going through as we talk about the discipleship process here at HWC. So we're going to start right there. Uh, We began this journey uh, several weeks ago uh, with step one, and this is your first fill-in-the-blank uh, and uh, you want to take notes because in a couple of weeks there will be a quiz. Uh, no, not really. So uh, anyway, step one, knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus. If we want to grow in Jesus and to serve Jesus, we need to know Jesus. Amen? Christ has given us the opportunity to be in relationship with him. It is through the blood of the Lamb that our fellowship with God has been restored. We're grateful for that today and that our sins have been forgiven. When you come to know Christ through salvation, I'm glad to also be able to declare that you also come to know his freedom and his forgiveness. Are you glad to be set free today? Come on, step number two. Step number two, knowing Jesus' church. The church is identified in Scripture as the body of Christ. We, the body of Christ, are to be the extension of Jesus' ministry until he returns. And in order for that to be in place, we must first know Jesus, and we must also know his church, his mission, his ministry, his compassion. And we must also operate in his empowerment that comes through the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Step number three, the step we're covering today, is growing in Jesus. Growing in Jesus. Knowing Jesus, knowing his church leads to growing in Christ. God desires for all of us to grow in him. That growth means that our hearts are opened and enlightened by his truth and by his wisdom. That growth means that our hope is fully placed in the Lord. That growth means that we come alive in the new identity given to us by Jesus and give praise for the inheritance that awaits those who place their faith in him. The main point that we're going to drive home today with this session is this. This growth in Jesus means we become less like the world, hallelujah, and more like Jesus. Step number four, we'll cover this in the near future, is serving Jesus. Serving Jesus. Jesus. This may be the final step in the process, but again, it is not a concluding step or the ending to the process. What I mean by that is that this process is ongoing. Serving Jesus becomes a daily thing. Serving Jesus is not something that we do per se, but it is, it is something that we become a servant of Christ. And just so that everybody is aware, again, in case you miss a fill-in-the-blank, the the answer key is at the back of the book. These are the four steps, the intentional action steps, that I want every person in this room to know very well. Prayerfully, by the end of this series, you will be able to quote these steps, and you will be engaged in the growth process. Here's the deal. Again, this is an ongoing, lifelong process that all believers should be actively 
engaged in. As long as we have breath in our lungs today, church, we should be knowing, growing in, and serving Jesus. There's always more to know about Jesus. There's always room for growth in our walk with Him. And there will always be opportunities to serve Him. And so this morning, we're going to look at what it means to grow in Christ. We are going to look at or talk about why it is important for us to grow in Him and how we can be actively growing in Jesus. And there's something important that I want us to understand that I want you to consider as we dive into this material today. First and foremost, I know we got several farmers and agricultural. In it. Do we have any garden, gardeners, green thumb people? Hold up your thumb if you're a green. Lexi's got her thumb up. Any other green? All right, so th- this is something that many of us will know. All living things grow. And that growth happens when all of the right ingredients, if you will, are present to make that growth happen. Now, I want to give this quick side note very quickly. In no way am I suggesting that we adopt a form of natural theology, a type of theological thinking that fosters the illusion that we can perceive and understand God on our own without Jesus, without the cross, or without revelation. I'm not trying to in any way, shape, or form push that, but listen to me. What I am talking about are the basic principles of growth. As believers who are now alive in Christ, are you a believer today? Are you alive in Jesus today? Come on. We should be growing in him daily. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, these are Paul's words. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ now lives within me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. As Paul is talking, he makes clear that sin was done away in his life because of what? Because that old life had been crucified through Christ. His sin was nailed to the cross through Jesus because of what Christ did for him. Church, it was because of what Christ did for all of us. How many understand this morning that when Christ was nailed to the cross, he took with him our sin Come on. He took with him our transgressions, our iniquities. There was nothing that Jesus did to deserve the crucifixion. He was sinless. He was blameless, which is why he was the only one worthy to do what he did for you and for me. Because he was sinless. Because he was blameless. His blood was the only pure source Powerful enough to cover the sins of all mankind. That's pretty cool. Yes. Amen. And in that moment, church, I know that crucifixion, uh, 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 it, it involved being nailed or being bound to that cross, but I'm sure you have heard this through uh, other, other means and such, but listen to me. It wasn't the nails that held Jesus to that cross. His life was not taken. His life was given yes. as a sacrifice for you and for me and because of what Jesus did you and I can be made alive we are no longer dead in sin hallelujah but made alive in Jesus Christ and Jesus himself church when you look at his stories and when you look at his ministry throughout the new testament or excuse me throughout the gospels Jesus himself frequently used stories and parables from nature and agriculture to illustrate the nature of the kingdom of god For example, he spoke of the lilies of the field. He talked about the seed that grows by itself. He talked about the growth of the mustard seed, the four different types of soil, uh, the tree and its fruit, the laws of sowing and reaping. He, He himself used this illustration when talking about growth. So here's my point. If Jesus lives within, we should be growing in him. Nobody? Uh, we got to go back to the basics. No, come on. If Jesus is alive within us, we should be growing in our walk with him every single day. Amen. Growing in Jesus means we become less like the world and more like Jesus. The first step to growing is understanding our new reality. 
We must understand our new reality. I'm so thankful for Amber's work as our worship leader and her sensitivity to the Spirit. She did not know I was going to be talking on this point when she selected the song, Who You Say I Am, for this morning. But just like Paul declared in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, if a person knows Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that person is no longer who they used to be. About seven of us are thankful for that today. Come on, if you are in Christ, as 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 says, you are a new creation. Behold, the old has gone, the new has come. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I like this translation. This is the New, Kings, uh, New King James uh, version this morning. I love the fact that it has that word, behold. It's a calling out. It's an emphasis on the new, helping to turn the eyes away from the old. Behold, all things have become new. I love this truth this morning. Why? Because it talks about the complete overhaul. It talks about the enormity of the real transformation that takes place when a person comes to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Church, the old is gone, passed away, meaning it is never coming back. And Think about that truth for a moment this morning. Your sins, your mess-ups, your wrongdoings, all of the things that, that, that maybe once labeled your life or all these things you used to hold on to, those transgressions, they are no more. Those things were impurities to your soul. Things that were robbing you of both spiritual and physical life. There's something we need to understand this morning, and I've quoted this or I've said this many times from the, from the pulpit we need to understand this morning, God did not create you, did not create us for sin. We weren't designed for sin. So the moment sin entered the picture, our entire be being, mind, body, soul, every part about us began to suffer. It's not a secret that I'm a car guy, so I think of it this way. What happens if you pour windshield wiper fluid in your engine block and antifreeze in your differential. What happens? You're not going to go very far. What happens when you put blinker fluid? No, not really. What happens if you put gasoline in your transmission and brake fluid in your radiator? You're not going to go very far. In fact, somebody said, you're going to blow up. Your car might run for a moment, but it's not going to go very far. Why? Because it was not designed for that kind of use, just as God did not create you for sin. The moment we invited sin into our lives is the moment that we invited death and destruction to our souls and bodies, church. We were not designed for this. But the moment that we call upon the name of the Lord, all of that sin is wiped out. I kind of expected a little bit more excitement on that one. Come on! The moment we call on his name, every bit of that sin is wiped out. Death no longer has mastery over us. We move from a position of certain spiritual death to a position of eternal life. Somebody give him glory in this place today. And John 3.16, probably the most quoted verse of all the Bible, tells us this truth. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. And that eternal life is the new church that has come. Paul says, behold, the new has come. If you are in Christ, raise your hand if you're in Jesus today. You believe in Christ. If you are in Christ, your entire spiritual reality has changed. The sin impurities that once existed have been completely washed away. 
That which was slowly robbing you of life is no more, and it has been replaced with the giver of eternal life, who is Jesus Christ our Lord. Again, can we give him glory and praise in this place? Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Secondly, in our growing steps to become more like Jesus, we must accept our new pursuit. First, we must understand the new reality. Secondly, we must accept our new pursuit. In light of our new reality, our life will experience or should experience a dramatic course correction, if you will, meaning we no longer pursue what we used to, but instead our lives are dedicated to following Jesus. The old that is now gone, uh, gone was leading us away from the truth and life that is Jesus. The old that is now gone was molding us and shaping us to look more like the world and less like Jesus. Therefore, as we embrace the new reality in Christ, we must also accept a new direction in life. If we desire to be disciples... If we desire to be followers of Jesus today, to grow in our walk with him, then we must follow the instruction that Jesus gave to us in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Whoever wants to be my disciple, let's pause. He wants to be a disciple today. All right, here's the road. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. This is an if-then statement coming from our Lord and Savior. It requires intentional action on our part. I always joke about this, but it is true today. If I want to get in better physical shape, then I must be willing to choose a better diet and exercise routine. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, we laugh at it, but I mean, seriously, anybody up for doing pizza for lunch today? Anyway, no, no, seriously, if, if, if I want to get in better shape, then I have to, I have to embrace the, the, the road to be able to get there. The if states the intention and then states the action that must be accepted in order for the if to become reality. So our Lord makes it clear today, if we want to be his disciples, then these things must take place. One, we must deny ourselves. That means our self is no longer in control. And quite honestly, church, to that statement, I say thank you, God, because my self can get me into a lot of trouble real fast. Come on. Secondly, we've got to take up our cross daily. This means we must go the way of the cross. This means we must endure whatever suffering may come and be faithful. This means we must be willing to go the distance, no matter how far and long that might be. And number three, we must follow him. This means we drop personal agenda and opinion. This means we don't do what is trendy and what culture is telling us to do. Instead, we concern ourselves with that, or with, with that which is holy. This means that Jesus is in the lead. And that no one and nothing else can take his place. Church, listen to me. Danger awaits the believer who does not accept the pursuit that Christ lays out for us. Matthew 7, this is Jesus speaking. Towards the end of his Sermon on the Mount, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many will enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. There is only one way. There is only one truth. There is only one life. And his name ain't Donald Trump. <laughs> no, I'm being serious for a moment. Because sometimes we idolize political individuals or big names in our culture and look to them as our Savior. No, there's only one Savior, and His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. And we need to make sure that we're following Jesus. The world may try to present different ideas, but listen to me, but the word is clear. 
You cannot remain in the secular mainstream and claim to be following Jesus. In fact, in 1 John, it calls that a lie. A choice must be made. Who or what will you follow? And in making that choice, there's one more step that we look at. Number three, we must receive our new mindset. And this is critical to the process. We must receive our new mindset. As devoted followers of Jesus, it is essential that we understand our new reality, that we accept our new pursuit, and that we allow our minds to be transformed. In my terms, I call it the reprogramming of the old gray matter. This thing up here. Although the old has gone, if you're like me, I needed to flush out some of the old junk that was still up here. Anybody else? Anybody still kind of wrestling with getting rid of some of that old junk? I mean, come on, you're in a safe place. Anybody? This can include a wide variety of things. It can include the way we view the world. It might be the way we view ourselves. It might be the way we live and we operate what we take in, what we apply to our lives. This is all about choosing to grow and to mature in our walk and understanding of God. As disciples of Christ's church, we take on a whole new look on life. No longer governed by the same things, nor are they influenced by the same thoughts. Church, listen to me. If we want to grow in the Lord this morning, we must give God full access to our minds and our way of thinking. And hear me, there are a lot of entities out there that are competing to gain your thoughts, your mind, your way of thinking today. They want to steer you their direction. Paul gives some incredible information regarding this, starting in Romans chapter 8. He says, those who live according to the flesh, look at this, have their what set on the flesh desires, their minds on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind that is governed by the flesh, I mean, he spells it out, is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and death. Peace. Now, if we pause for just a moment right there, how many today would say, man, that sounds good? Life and peace. Verse 7, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Verse 8, those who are in the realm of the flesh, this hurts, cannot please God. Ouch! If a person who believes in the Lord but continues to live by the flesh, if they continue to have a mind that is on what the flesh desires, then all they will find is death and destruction that comes with such living. But if a person who believes in the Lord receives a new mindset given by the Spirit of God, they receive governance and guidance from the Spirit and the Word of God. Their mind will know life and peace. So the answer to receiving this new mindset, it also comes from the book of Romans, specifically in chapter 12. He says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship, and this is how it's done. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So the answer is to stop conforming, church, and to be transformed. And that transformation comes as we allow the Spirit of God and the Word of God to renew our mind. If we want to grow in our walk with Jesus today, then we must, we must, we must, we must, we must give Him full access and governance of our minds. Because I can tell you straight up, if left unchecked, if left under our control, this can become the greatest battleground you will face. It's hidden. 
It's off limits to most. It's not all over the, the social media airways. I mean, it is as much as you want it to be. But what goes on up here will affect you in life. What we allow to come into this will affect you in your life. What we see, what we listen to, what we read, all of these things will have an impact on who we are and what we end up following. So I encourage you today, church, to receive that new mindset that can only come through the Holy Spirit today. To allow God to come in and to begin to overhaul some of your thoughts, begin to overhaul some of the ways you view this world, begin to overhaul some of the, the, the things that you might say or that you might feel. And here's the cool part. Everything that he does in your life is going to line up with this. If it doesn't, it's not coming from God. End of story. Drop the mic, period, however you want to say it. If what is getting implanted in this mind does not line up with this word, be careful who you're listening to. Because I said before, and I'll say it again, there's a lot of different voices competing for your mind today, competing for your heart today, competing for your pursuit. Those sources want to plant seeds in your life according to their agenda, according to what they want to accomplish. Can I tell you something? There is no greater mission, no greater agenda than what's spelled out in this book today. Amen. God wants to forgive you, wants to renew you, wants to set your heart free, wants to bring you online in accordance to his redemptive purposes here on this planet and has gifted you eternal life today. Has poured out his grace, has poured out his mercy, has poured out his love, church, for you and for me. Once again, I think that's a point where we need to give God praise in this place. Amen. Come on. I want to know him. I want to grow in him. I want to be his disciple. Anybody else share that desire this morning? Leanne, if I could go ahead and have your help on the keyboard. I know I didn't make it through all of the book today. The answers are at the end of, of the deal. But here's where I want us to pause for just a moment, and I want us to, to make application today. We want to be his disciple. We want to know him. We want to be growing in him. I want us to close our eyes and bow our heads all across this place. And maybe you're here today and you'd say, you know, Pastor, I hear what you're saying. I, I've, I've struggled, though, in, in maybe accepting who I am. I, I've, I've, I've struggled, though, in, in, in understanding God's plan for my life. Can I tell you something today? I really do believe that a lot of this comes down to the transforming or the renewing of our minds. If our minds are out of sorts, our pursuit is going to be out of sorts. If our minds are out of sorts, that acceptance of who we are in Christ is going to be out of sorts. I believe, I just... I believe in light of everything that the Spirit has been doing in this place right now, God is wanting to renew some minds today. That God is wanting to renew some thoughts. That God is wanting to clean house, maybe, in some situations. And I want to, again, say something very serious. You're in a safe place. This is not a place of condemnation. This is a place of forgiveness and freedom. Amen? God is wanting to do some work in the area of our minds today. I just feel this in my heart. And maybe you've been withholding. Maybe you haven't given God of all parts. Maybe you've got that secret compartment. Maybe you've got those thoughts that you don't, you don't let out. Maybe you've got those feelings or those tendencies that, that, that you've, you've tried to keep tucked away and that you've tried to, tried to excuse or whatever you've tried to do. Can I tell you something? What God wants to do in you right now 
is renew your mind. He wants to set you free today. He wants to set you free today. I'm going to ask you to do something very, it's, it's bold, but it's a step of faith. Symbolic. I'm going to ask you to come to these altars, and the reason I'm going to ask you to do that this morning, I want you to see it in this way. You're walking away from the ways of the world and becoming more like Jesus. You're walking away from those thoughts. You're walking away from those things maybe that have been robbing you. Yes, your thoughts can rob you of life today. I speak that from experience. Ten years, ten years I allowed one thought to rob me of a relationship never again. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I want God to renew some things that are happening in my mind today. I want you to take a step of faith. There is no judgment. Hallelujah. There's people already moving. There is no judgment. I've got to get some things today under the blood. I've got to get these things in the hands of Jesus.